So I think we'll make a start um, and obviously there might be other people joining us as I make the introductions. Um, we're delighted to welcome you all to this evening's lecture with Dr Nicola Allen, Deeds and Words, the Fiction of Suffragette Leader Constance Nina Boyle. And we're delighted to welcome Nicola for her first public lecture with us. This lecture is the third in a series of humanities public lectures that University Centre Telford are hosting. My name is Paula Harrison and I'm the coordinator of University Centre Telford. We're part of the University of Wolverhampton. We're a regional learning centre based in the heart of Telford in Shropshire. And for those of you who know Telford, we're in the Southwater building. We would normally hold our public lecture programme um, in our centre in Telford, but obviously because of the current pandemic, we can't do that. And we've moved our lectures online. And since March, April time last year, we have had a huge range of lectures, all of which have been very successful and have attracted a global audience. Now, just before I hand over to Nicola, just a couple of housekeeping um, things to go through. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the lecture, and you will see if you're on a desktop or a laptop, that there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen in the middle. If you could use that for your um, questions and I'll read them out then to Nicola. Um, if you're using a mobile, that button will be in the top right hand corner. Just to remind you that the lecture is being recorded. So please, can I ask you not to share any personal information in the Q&A box? Um, and also the recording will be uploaded to our University Centre Telford YouTube channel um, about a week to 10 days afterwards, so you can see the recording there. So Nicola is a senior lecturer in English literature at the University of Wolverhampton, and she's been with us since 2016. Before coming to Wolverhampton, she taught at the University of Northampton, and she completed her PhD at Birmingham City University. So a very warm welcome to you, Nicola. Thank you very much for delivering this lecture tonight. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Um, I'm really glad that you can join me. Um, I'm gonna just sort of really hopefully guide you through um, some of the highlights um, of Constance Nina Boyle. I think that she's a fabulous um, figure. And I think that she's particularly interesting because um, she's kind of known to historians, um, so she was um, the lead, uh, one of the sort of um, kind of uh, leaders of a, a group called the Women's Freedom League, um, and um, she's, as, as we'll see, she's kind of remembered in history, but she was also a prolific novelist. She wrote 12 novels, but she wrote them all after she was injured um, in later life, and that kind of made uh, it a little bit more difficult for her to do what she became sort of well known for, which was kind of get on the road and go and sort of promote women's uh, women's rights, really. Um, so um, I want to just start by sort of um, telling you how I got to hear about her, because I think that's kind of interesting. So um, she's the woman that you can see in the top row of the pictures there. She's the woman that's sort of standing uh, behind the kind of um, little desk that's got all the copies of the vote on it and she's uh, which is the the publication of the Women's Freedom League which she was also obviously heavily involved in um, and um, yeah she was incredibly uh, prolific as a as a writer and a campaigner um, and um, I think um, kind of deserves to be better remembered really. Um, so my route to finding out about her, so I should just say that I'm actually an uh, English literature specialist, I'm not a historian, um, so I think it's interesting because she's a novelist, so I should have heard of her really, um, but I sort of came to know her through a, a fairly sort of strange route, so I just want to kind of sort of tell you about that really because it allows me to tell you about a couple of other characters that were her really close friends that are also really interesting then I want to tell you a bit about um her her fiction and then I'll sort of um you know hopefully um answer any questions that you, that you might have um about her um so yeah let's so it's sort of um started with a book 
many things do for me. And so as I say, I'm not a historian. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm interested in English literature. And I read many years ago when it first came out, I read Ali Smith's Girl Meets Boy. Um, and it's a, it's a brilliant book, but it's got this character in it that's really fascinating, who goes by the name of Burning Lil. And she's a suffragette um, who makes these amazing escapes. Um, she's kind of well known as a sort of escape artist. She keeps, um, you know, evading the police. One of the things that she does that I was really drawn to, um, she's kind of a small, slight woman. Um, and she's uh, being held um, in a house under the Cat and Mouse Act. So she's been released from prison because they think she might die. And they don't want a suffragette to die in prison because it, the, the government don't want the publicity of that. So they, they sort of force feed them, they get pneumonia, then they get sent home to sort of recover. But obviously they're not meant to escape. So the house is guarded, she's in this terraced house. There are police at the front and the back of the house. Um, and, um, and Lil several times escapes as washing, um, but then they realize that she's escaped as washing. Um, so um, when she's done this several times and then burnt, you know, sort of burnt more houses down because that's her form of protest, um, they sort of you know, capture her again and they decide, okay, we're gonna check, you know, we're not gonna let her do this. Um, so the suffragettes organize this event where um, the laundry van turns up, but she's not gonna get in the van because everyone's expecting her to do that. Um, out of the van jump all of these women dressed as laundry boys. So they've got the kind of collars turned up, the Baker boy cap on, holding big apples so that you can't really see their face. Uh, laundry boy goes into the house um, and, um, and, and Lil and all these women just flood the street and the police know that she's one of them but they have no idea which one and she gets away um, and she gets away and she escapes to France um, and on the way um, she burns down Kew Gardens um, like you do. Um, so this she's a fantastic character um, and in the back of the book, um, there's this little note, and Hatley Smith says, this is actually a real person. Um, she's a real person that people don't really know very much about. Um, and I was just fascinated, decided I wanted to know more about her. Now, you can actually, you might be lucky enough to study Lil at school now. She's far more well known than she was in those days. Um, but I was fascinated by her, but I kept sort of thinking, well, you know, she's an historical figure. Yeah, she's a, you know, she's a character in this book and that is wonderful, but, you know, she's an historical figure and I do literature, you know, I must, I must try to, uh, to concentrate on my, you know, on that. Um, but then I, I, I just, I had to just find out more. So I ended up uh, kind of researching her and I found out about a couple of the people that she kind of, uh, hung out with. So there's Lil in the middle with the number 12. That's actually a photograph that was taken without her consent when she was in prison. Obviously the, the authorities wanted to be able to recognize these women. Um, so that's a surveillance photograph when she's taking exercise in the yard um, of, of prison. Um, and either side of her, um, are the lady that's sitting on the chair that looks very poorly is a woman called Olive Wary, and I'll explain why she looks like that in a little bit. Now, Olive and Lil are really the, the people that sort of set fire to buildings and that kind of escalated the kind of militant action of the suffragettes. Um, and, I th and they are just sort of fascinating women. It's very important to say that they didn't ever hurt anybody and that that was really important to both of them. They were very, very meticulously careful that they would destroy property that was owned by people with wealth and influence. They, they were very careful not to hurt anybody. In fact, there was, uh, they, they entered a building once and discovered some squatters there. And so they said, oh yeah, okay, <laughs> we're, not gonna, we're not gonna do anything to this building. So, you know, <laughs> they're terrorists with, a, you know, with an ethical edge, I think. Um, but they're, you know, they're fascinating figures. And then they had this friend. So she didn't go and burn buildings with them. She was a bit more reserved, but she was um, in her action but she was certainly um, as interesting and as committed to the course. And that's Constance Nina Boyle. And she's the lady that you can see the, the portrait of um, with the little poodle. Um, so these, these, as I say, these two women knew each other. Um, after the vote was won, they actually traveled uh, through France and through post-revolutionary Russia together. Um, and they wrote reports. Uh, they were involved um, in the very early days of the Save the Children Fund. 
uh, in the National Union of Women Teachers, um, and also in, ver in various animal charities as well. So they were incredibly um, sort of, you know, active women, and it seemed like nothing would kind of stop them. And as I say, also great friends. Um, so, you know, but still they're figures from history. And then I kind of discovered, I kept seeing at the bottom of the stuff about Nina, um, the lady with the dog, um, that um, she'd written these 12 novels. Um, and most of them are out of print, but they're actually fairly easy to get hold of. You can actually get hold of them for a few pennies. Um, and if you do sort of, you know, want to spend a few pennies, as it were, um, you get these, this is one beautiful, this cost me two pence, um, plus posting and packing. Um, and it's a beautiful first edition of her first novel from 1920. Um, and I thought, this is fabulous. Um, you know, I've got somebody that I can write about. Started reading the books and I thought, actually, this is not just an excuse to write about this woman. She's an incredible writer. Um, and, you know, more people should know about her. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's the plan. Just to give you a flavour of them. Um, this is this is Lil. So, as I said, the three of them work together quite a lot. Uh, they got arrested together for obstructing courtrooms. Now, usually these were courtrooms where they felt women were being treated badly and often against the law, actually. So one of the things that Nina was really interested in was the way that women um, are treated in cases of um, domestic abuse or assault. Um, and she felt that women were treated very badly in court. They were frequently forced to give evidence alone um, in front of what would have then been an all male court. Um, and she, the, she actually wrote um, several times to several judges and she got this practice outlawed but many judges just ignored it. So, the, you're, you know, if you were a female giving evidence um, in a case of, um, you know, a, a, of some sort of abuse, you would be allowed to have a, a, another female present um, in order that you could feel a bit more secure. But many judges just couldn't do this. They would frequently just order all of the women out of the court if they felt that the material that was going to be discussed was kind of sensitive or that it might upset women to hear about other women getting abused. And, and so this meant that frequently, even though it wasn't actually meant to be happening, women were alone in court giving evidence. And Nina and Olive and Lil actually uh, chained themselves to the front of courtrooms, refused to leave courtrooms when ordered, um, and, and you know, kind of made a nuisance of themselves because they were so appalled at this practice. Um, and just to give you a flavour of how um, incredibly infectious their drive is. Um, so you can see um, Lil in the top picture there, as you can see Lil and you can see gentleman either side of her, the, the, the guy that's kind of got his hand on his face, he's actually a, a journalist called Harry Johnson, who was sent to interview her. They were getting famous, you know, um, and he was sent to interview her. Um, and within two weeks, he was arrested for burning buildings with her. So, you know, she's that kind of infectious in her, you know, in her kind of fervor for women's rights. Um, he gets arrested. Um, Lil escapes because she's very good at escaping. And the judge says to Harry Johnson, I'll sentence you to, uh, I think it's nine months um, hard labor, unless you tell me where she is. And good on him, Harry Johnson refuses to tell the judge where Lillian is. He says, the only person that should be going to prison with me today is the Home Secretary for his treatment of Lillian Lenton. Um, I suspect he doesn't know where she is, but I love the fact that he refuses to, to tell the judge. They have this enormous, infectious desire to make things better for women. And don't forget when they're doing this, women have fewer rights in law than farm animals. Um, you know, they've really got sort of, the weight of all of the judicial system on, you know, against them and they're pushing. And, and I think it's really interesting to think as well that, you know, suffragettes did this. They weren't just concerned about the vote. They were concerned about so many other elements of women's lives. And um, Nina, actually uh, Lillian's friend, the novelist that I'm interested in, went on to argue and to be really instrumental um, in getting more women on the police force, um, more women in uh, kind of positions of lawmaking. She felt that without 50-50 spread um, of women in those kind of jobs, which of course we still don't have, um, and Cressida Dick only last year said that we won't see it in her lifetime. 
um, she felt that without 50-50 representation, women would always um, suffer um, in, you know, in, in court um, and, and kind of uh, when, you know, when facing arrest as well. So there's some really interesting sort of things that kind of come up here. I want to kind of um, talk a little bit about that Olive and then Nina's the main focus really of the presentation. So Olive, really important, uh, she went on hunger strike for 32 days, um, which is some going. Um, she left prison weighing five stone and that's why she can't lift up her head for the campaign photo. Um, but she also kept extensive prison scrapbooks of the activities of her fellow suffragettes, especially Lillian, who was still on the run once um, Olive and Harry had gone to prison. Um, and I love how you can see her sort of memorialising these, you know, her sister's acts, really. Um, you can have a look at these. They're on the British Library website. Some, sometimes they're a bit easier to find than others. Um, but they're beautiful, beautiful scrapbooks. Um, she was also an artist and they're, they're gorgeous beautiful illustrations um she depicts like a sort of dinosaur that she says is a force i can't remember what she calls it something like a force feeder a saurus or something and it's got a really long neck so it's impossible for you to force feed it um so you can really see kind of what she's going through in prison and she seems to think it's really important that she recalls in her own words what's going on and there you can see she's recorded little burning down uh, kew gardens um the orange house at kew gardens um, and yeah, I think that the idea of, you you know, leaving a kind of legacy of words starts to become important. Um, and this is where this is where Nina comes in, because this is where Nina really sort of takes over. So like I say, she wrote she wrote two campaign books and she wrote 12 novels. They're now mostly out of print, but not that difficult to get hold of and very cheap. Um, so like Lillian, she's known about and she's remembered to some extent, it would be unfair to say that she's completely forgotten, that's not true. Um, but there's there's very little work on her on her novels actually, and there is no kind of single author's study of her, uh, which is what I'm attempting to redress um, with my book. But um, I think, you know, she should be more well, well known about. And as a writer, I think she's actually really important. Um, I think there are several reasons why she's probably been forgotten. Um, and one is, I think, that she's got this status as a suffragette. So in a way, her writing is always thought of as something that belongs to history. Um, you know, it's important, but it's important to history. Um, but actually, her work is really interesting for people that study literature. Now, it's not necessarily very literary, uh, which I don't know how you feel about that. That might be a relief to some of you. Um, it's actually kind of popular fiction. Um, but it interacts with some of the, the text from the canon in some incredibly interesting ways. Um, and, and she's got lots to say about romance fiction and she's got lots to say about girls as readers. And of course, we know that um, really through the 19th century, women have you know, become much more literate. Women are consuming fiction at an astonishing rate. And she kind of realizes, I think, that it's a space where you can reach an audience. And this becomes increasingly important actually after the vote is won. Um, I think one of the things that perhaps have kind of slipped out of our sort of um, collective memories is that once the vote had been won, and actually these women had, they had changed the world. They had made an enormous difference. Um, and in a sense, this created a kind of backlash and like I say, lots of the suffragettes, the vote is, a, is an incredibly important issue, but there are lots of issues around women's rights and women's lives that they're interested in. And it actually becomes more difficult to have some of those conversations. There's a sense of you've got the vote, you know, just shut up. Um, and one of, the, one of the ways in which I think Nina kind of resists that is in the novel. It's a space where she can create a world of her own, where she can comment on that world, where she can reach audiences um, of, you know, vast amounts of women um, through lending libraries that exist. Um, and so it, it becomes a tool um, to reach women, to talk about women, to create a community of, of readers who are interested in women's rights. Um, but I think we've got to be a little bit careful not to therefore think that it has only relevance in history. Because actually, like I say, our books are incredibly interesting to us as people that are interested um, in literature and in fiction. 
Um, this is uh, just to give you again, this is from uh, Nina's obituary. So I want to talk a bit about Nina's character. Um, I love this. It's a quote from um, the, her obituary from the Yorkshire Evening Post, but they had actually interviewed her several times um, throughout her life. And uh, this is from, uh, they quote an interview that they'd done with her about her suffragette days. She says, it was fun. I would lie in my cell and think up some new mischief and how we could diddle them. Happiest days of my life. Um, and I think that really, you know, that comes across in the end of this kind of, um, you know, joie de vivre, this kind of um, joy and energy um, that never really wanes, to be honest. Um, she, you know, she's kind of um, fairly elderly, actually, when she starts writing. Um, but she's still just sort of full of life. Um, so, yeah, she was perhaps slightly less militant as a suffragette. She wasn't taking part in burning the buildings, but she was incredibly important. Um, she was the first woman to stand for selection as a candidate in an election. So there was a Keeley by-election before the general election that was to be the first time that women could stand. So um, Nina knew that um, unless you could get a woman to be allowed to stand, there was always the potential that um, the authorities could say there's no precedent for a female candidate, so we won't accept one. This had actually happened to an atheist beforehand. Um, so Charles Bradlaugh kept getting elected, but because he was an atheist um, and he wouldn't swear on the Bible, um, the government sort of said, well, there's no precedent for this, so we're not actually, uh, even though you've won the election, we're not actually going to allow you to take up your seat. And Nina was worried that this same kind of thing might happen to women. So you could end up being allowed to stand, but then not allowed to take your seat, even if you win. So um, I'm pretty sure she has actually no um, desire to be elected at this point. I think what she's done is she's realised that there has to be a precedent. So she manages to get herself selected. She stands as an independent. Um, and there's, then a, there's a discrepancy in the paperwork that means that she doesn't actually um, campaign. But what you've got is you've got the electoral officer has actually accepted a woman as a candidate. Sounds a bit mad, but that needed to happen for then those women to stand in the later general election and to, and to get elected. And I think she's actually an incredibly important part of women getting elected, uh, but she's kind of been forgotten. And I think this is kind of typical of Nina. There's a sort of selfless kind of intelligence to her. Um, she's always there behind the scenes. She's always there making sure that other women get the opportunities that they need. Um, and I don't think it's odd because there were just apparently there were discrepancies in her paperwork. Now, Nina was incredibly diligent, incredibly intelligent. I don't think she actually wanted to stand. I think she wanted to create the precedent to allow other women to stand. And I just think she's kind of fabulous for that. Um, she was also instrumental in um, getting the first women on the police force. So she believed that unless we could have women police officers, women lawmakers, women at every level of um, society, even with the vote, we wouldn't have equality. Um, so she works incredibly hard um, to, to make sure that women um, get to become police officers. She does this in a really brilliant, sneaky, typical Nina way. So she writes to the Home Office and it's the outbreak of the First World War. Uh, and she writes to the Home Secretary and she says, look, um, all of the men that would be police officers or many of the men that would be police officers, they're going to get called up. They're going to come back injured. You're not going to have enough uh, recruits very soon why don't you let women stand? Um, and she sends this off. And while she's waiting for a reply, because I suspect she knows what the reply will be, she says, oh, it's okay. I've, I've dealt with the Home Office. Let's start recruiting. So she designs a uniform and she recruits two female officers. The reply comes back um, and says no, uh, but she's already done it, basically. She sets up the first women's police force. Um, I think another testament, I just want to give you this other anecdote before I talk about a fiction, because I think it's another testament to kind of how incredible she is. So she actually ends up then leaving the women's um, police force very soon after it's formed because um, she's putting, she's sort of second in command. First in command is a woman called Margaret Dama Dawson. Now she's not a suffragette. 
um, and she's the sister-in-law of um, a brigadier in the army. Um, and Nina's whole sense of the police and having women on the police force is that these women are going to treat women differently. So female victims of crime, female perpetrators of crime, uh, witnesses, uh, women are going to bring something different to the police force. Um, and Nina is very, very, you know, clear on that. And this, this will help the emancipation of women. It will help society to become more feminine. And that will be a good thing. Um, and essentially, she sort of feels that, um, that this is not about getting women to do the same job that men did. This is about actually transforming the police force. The police force itself will be different because of women. Margaret Diamond Dawson doesn't really have the same sense of that. Um, and essentially um, an act is passed that imposes a curfew on women in garrison towns. Uh, so they need to be indoors. I think it's from 7 p.m. until 10 a.m. It's a really long curfew. Uh, so basically women mustn't leave their own homes between these times in an attempt to stop prostitution and the spread of venereal disease. And Nina basically says, I cannot have my female officers um, engaged in this action. Um, this is an insane way of attempting to stop prostitution and venereal disease. It doesn't address the causes of prostitution. It doesn't address, um, you know, the, the need that people have. Um, it just punishes all women um, because you're worried about, you know, you're worried about prostitution. So um, she resigns, she walks away months after she'd sort of started this. And I think that she has such incredible integrity and such a clear sense of what women's rights should, should be. So putting a, you know, putting a woman in what had previously been, you know, a man's job to enforce a patriarchal law, she says, no, uh, we're not doing that. So basically she puts it to a vote. The members vote that they are actually okay with upholding this. So, so Nina walks away um, and she's just, I think, an incredible, incredible character. Um, and yeah, one of the things that she's kind of turned to after all of this amongst many is she writes novels. Um, I think she's kind of always a writer and we can see this, um, I think in, um, so that, that's just another, that slide is just another lovely. There's a picture of the women wearing the police uniform that Nina actually designed, uh, one of her many skills. It's just another obituary that you can see how many things she's done really. Um, so she went to jail five times. Um, she's um, interested in the Save the Children Fund um, and yet yeah, says that she formed the Women's Police Force. So there you go, there's proof that what I said is true. Um, but yeah, I wanna just um, have a look at one of the things that, that she said really. Because uh, I think this is key to her fiction. This kind of leads us into talking a bit more about her fiction. I'll give you a you know, sense of some of her novels in a second. Um, this is an article in The Vote. So this is the publication of the Women's Freedom League. And it's written really at the, the beginning of the Second World War. Uh, sorry, the First World War. So I've lost all history. The First World War. Um, she says, to women, man has always posed as protector plus owner. He has ignored the obvious fact that his own existence constitutes her chief need for protection. Whether he be the potential soldier who with a cry women's places in the home on his lips yet claims the right, if his warfare demands it, to destroy that home, or whether he be the unknown element every woman is afraid to meet in a lonely lane or in the dark, man is the prevailing danger. And in view of this special danger, which comes only from one sex and only affects the other, how can men be so ungenerous as to not deny women the vote and with the vote the means of adequately protecting ourselves and punishing the guilty in regard to these crimes? So she's got this real sense that unless you let women have a voice, unless you let women have the vote, um, you're going to have this situation in which um, one sex, she says, you know, poses a danger to the other and that will go, you know, unanswered for. One of the things I think is so incredibly sad is that this was said in 1915, but it sounds very similar to discussions that we've had, unfortunately, very recently um, around the Sarah Everard murder. Um, and I think one of Nina's points is, unless you have a kind of 50-50 representation, um, you, you know, you're always gonna have um, essentially one gender potentially being, um, you know, not, 
protected fully enough but she's also interested in this idea of protection and I think she thinks it's a rather misused term so you know women are going to be put under a curfew for their own protection women are going to stay at home for their own protection and I think she finds some of the language around women's rights worth investigating and of course a novel then becomes a space in which she can do exactly that she can do some of that investigating um and she, yeah I think she's kind of very very good at um at writing at knowing how to you know how to get people on side through words so you know Lil is fabulous um with her matches Nina um you know has has her own kinds of um fire um so this is from a brilliant brilliant unpublished PhD uh, by Hilary Francis um and she's kind of talking about um the way in which Nina Boyle uh, gets people on side, you know. So she says in a 1914 article called Judicial Barbarity, Nina Boyle recommended a few days in court with Edith Watson to throw a vivid light on how the system operates. Endeavouring to stir a response from readers, she painted a picture of victimised women. She used emotive language to unpick and convey the theatricality of court proceedings. Of prostitutes in court, she said it was a distressing and um, pitiable spectacle to see how girls and women labelled unfortunate were badgered and browbeaten by the trained intellects of men whose business it is to protect the vile privileges of their sex. It was common for the bench to convert itself into an additional assistant to the male cause, so reinforcing prejudice. Questions would be put to a witness that involved details of such filthiness and sa uh, the soul sickens. Then the subject matter was used unscrupulously to discredit the witness who shrank from the council's bullying. Here, Francis says, emotive imagery, alliteration, repetition, enhance the melodramatic um, association, the melodramatic effect of the title, which resonates with associations of brutish force. The writing can be seen as an attempt to harness the repugnance conventionally associated with prostitution, then deflect readers' horror onto the court, the patriarchal agent of control. So in other words, she's using her language to, you know, she, to sort of, uh, she's using the language that she employs here to take on some of the um, associations, that the, the linguistic associations we might have with prostitution to deflect those and to actually put them back on the court. In other words, she's a writer, um, you know, she's, she's got this incredible skill. She does make people listen. She does change the law, actually, um, you know, several times. One of the key things that she did, uh, which is actually really horrible, but it was common practice to put suffragettes in prison vans with male sex offenders and you would allow what was going to happen to happen. Um, the idea is that it would um, deter the suffragettes if they had the terrible experience in the prison van. And Nina actually, you know, documents this, she experiences this, and she does not stop writing about it. She writes letters, she writes articles. She's incredibly good at, at sort of taking, like Hilary Francis says, some of the associations that you might have, um, you know, that you might use to discredit women and turning them on their head, using them to kind of discredit the patriarchal order that she's seeking to essentially overthrow. Um, but yeah, she's a writer. She's always a writer. And I think it's worth remembering that because her novels then, you know, become even more important, I think. Um, so, yeah. Let's have a quick look at her as a writer and then I'll stop and um, and, and um, you know, you can ask any questions. Um, so Julian Simmons in Bloody Murder is writing about, you know, the horrible crime fiction of the, the sort of uh, the 1920s. Um, the kind of, you know, the, it's some of the stuff that Nina actually kind of uses. She uses lots of genres. She uses romance, crime, sort of, um, you know, kind of like, um, Kind of like detective stuff um but frequently there isn't really a detective that the reader's actually doing it um it's really popular stuff for the 1920s and julian simmons says something really interesting here so he says that the reading habits of the public actually shape the plots and the concerns of the crime fiction genre in the 20s with an increasing number of lending libraries such as boots and wh smiths in britain um, so I love this. I love the idea that Beats and W.H. Smith, um, you could actually just go in and, 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 you know, borrow a book. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? You have to pay a small fee, but, you know, I kind of think that would be quite a nice thing to re return, actually. Anyway, um, but Simmons uh, says, 
the preferences of a large the large number of women who patronize these libraries and it is predominantly women that are um you know subscribing to these libraries must have had an effect on the literature that was subsequently produced and consumed so he kind of identifies this might be a female space and i think maybe slightly over overly optimistic but it's it's an interesting idea um so yeah nina is um a lo lovely you know beautiful books that i've got if you look inside them they're nearly all copies that were once held in these kinds of libraries um she was you know she was around in the in these places so let's have a look at kind of what what do we want then and you know they frequently all 12 novels are available clearly um you know people want the next installment you know she's popular um so so yeah this is nicola humble who kind of theorizes you know sort of what women want and she sort of says that there's this thing called the feminine middle brow which is probably the genre that we might put somebody like nina boyle in um so they're not you know they're not high literature they're not kind of you know they're not really sort of trashy they're somewhere kind of in the middle what she says is actually a powerful force in establishing and consolidating but also in resisting new class and gender identities um, and it's its paradoxical allegiance to both domesticity and a radical sophistication that makes this literary form so ideologically flexible and i think you know it is ideologically flexible one of the things that interested me about the, the first novel of nina's that i read is that it's got this incredible crime thriller narrative and then a marriage and you're sort of thinking that doesn't really make sense but it, it kind of does make sense if we think about it in the terms that Nicola Humble outlines so um your your heroine can go on this incredible journey and our heroine in Out of the Frying Pan uh Nina's first novel uh is Maisie who's 16 when the book starts um and basically her school fees are not getting paid uh, and she she needs to find out why uh, and her mom's actually kind of d disappeared um, she bumps she actually bumps into her mom in the Swiss Alps like you do um, and it turns out that her mom is part of this crime syndicate um, that are basically running gambling dens but they're kind of fixing fixing stuff um, and if you win too many times you disappear um, so it's, you know, it's quite nasty stuff that she uh, um, her mom's involved in so she thinks this is awful i'm gonna go find my dad turns out her dad is an even worse criminal um who's stealing state secrets um and selling them to the to the highest bidder uh, she uncovers this she returns he steals plans for a warship um she finds out that he's done this she returns him to the rightful place um she sort of gets he frames his own daughter for the crime um and um and she and she basically manages to solve it all in the courtroom she explains what's gone wrong it all gets solved um and then she marries this rookie police officer that actually had failed to save her he hadn't worked it out and he hadn't saved her um and you kind of think god that's a bit rubbish <laughs> like what, what, why can't she just carry on solving crimes but actually there's something really interesting that happens in the book so she spends a lot of time thinking about whether she wants to marry him or not um and she's kind of really you know she outlines that she's got options um and actually the end of the book a bit like jane eyre before it actually where she does marry you know chapter 28 reader i married him but then there's like another load of chapters because actually it's not the end of Maisie's life it's not the end of Maisie's story and actually the true reward which i think is really lovely for solving the crime is that she gets to have this house with a huge library in it um, and she can carry on learning and it's just gorgeous so we can see here that there's this kind of allegiance to domesticity in some senses although i think nina perhaps goes further than most in sort of trying to kind of deconstruct that in some really clever ways um she also puts in these really interesting things about kind of romance and about female sexuality so one of the things that happens to Maisie which is incredibly radical for the time um Maisie ends up um getting seduced by um, a man that it turns out is married but she doesn't realize that he's married um and um <clears throat> when she does realize she kind of confronts him about this and obviously she's angry um, and he essentially reminds her that he was her first lover he says you won't forget that you can't forget that that much belongs to me anyhow that i was the first and it's this awful moment where you sort of realize that you know he thinks he's got some sort of ownership over her he kind of thinks that you know he's kind of ruined her um 
And her reaction is just brilliant. Angrily, she slams and bolted the door after him. Whatever good impression he had succeeded in making was obliterated. Um, I love this because I think it's actually doing something quite radical, even though it might not be immediately obvious. It basically, you can see the two different sort of ways in which these characters regard um, you know, their love affair. So he thinks, um, you know, well, basically I own you now. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm the first and that's, that's relevant, that's important. She thinks, well, it might have been nice, but actually you're incredibly impolite. She sort of relegates, um, in a sense, the, their affair um, to, to the status of, you know, a kind of um, a sort of social gaffe, really. He, you know, he had made a good impression, but he'd ruined it now. Um, and I think this is incredibly empowering for Maisie. She's not ruined. It's not going to have a lasting effect. And it doesn't. She does marry somebody else. Um, it actually sets her free. And as a protagonist of a novel, setting a young woman free in this way, relegating, you know, um, sex that you regret to a social faux pas is incredibly radical. Um, and, and I just love the fact that she does this again and again. In several of her books, she does this. Um, she also is a little bit sneaky, perhaps a little bit naughty. Um, she also has lots of widows, uh, widows who are incredibly happy. Um, so in the, the protagonist of her third novel, Nor Are Thy Tears, is a woman called Lean, um, who's 40, and her husband, um, who's a drunken gambler and a philanderer, uh, gets drunk and falls into a river on the way home and drowns. Um, and Lean decides that actually she doesn't need to keep the dogs in the yard anymore. She can let them in. She can let them on the sofa. Um, she can uh, tell her daughter the facts of life. She doesn't have to do any of the things that he thought were right and proper. One of the things she loves doing is she, she lights the candles and she doesn't shut the curtains. So, you know, all of this kind of sense of propriety, all of this sense of being, you know, a, a wife and mother, it's all gone. Um, so she's this 40 year old widow um, and she's basically contemplating her future. And we're told life and excitement to Lean did not by any means imply romantic adventure. She's not looking for another fella. No, Lean wanted to live. She wanted to see and hear all sorts of things, to meet all sorts of people, to go to all sorts of places, to eat all sorts of food, to keep all sorts of hours, to do nothing at all because it ought to be done. That was what's about life and freedom. It's just lovely. And it infects her so much that actually one of the other characters comments um, on Lean. I hope my widow, if ever there is one, will pay me the compliment of not looking quite so emancipated. Um, so there's these lovely little kind of sneaky little bits in the, in the book that I think are perhaps there to kind of guide women out of thinking that romance is the end of the story, that marriage is the end of your story. She's also got a lovely quote where she says that some of the most interesting people that she knows are 80 year old women who have lived and who nobody listens to, but they should. And I think there's just this wonderful kind of appreciation of other women, appreciation of older women, unmarried women that she's just, um, you know, really good at. Um, and it's really important, I think, these books are sort of, you know, out there for young girls to read. Um, so there's something quite nice. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about um, probably the easiest one to get hold of and the easiest one to sort of, um, uh, to kind of relate to another text. Because one of the really key things that Nina does, frequently, she kind of rewrites other texts. And she sort of rewrites um, Northanger Abbey. I probably won't have time to go into loads of detail about this, but I'll give you the sort of, you know, the kind of outlines of it. Um, so one of the really important things about Jane Austen, who was a figure that suffragettes uh, really looked up to, and, um, you know, one of Nina's friends, Cicely Hamilton, uh, used Jane Austen in her brilliant sort of pageant of leading women. Jane Austen was one of the leading women. Although interestingly, the estate of Jane Austen, her nephew, I think he was, was a bit worried about this. He wasn't sure she would have been a suffragette. Um, so I think it's interesting that um, Nina kind of claims her, I think, but in a, again, in a subtle way. So one of the things Jane Austen focuses on is the idea that reading is this community um, and that actually it's kind of weird that novels actually don't talk about reading very much. 
Um, so this is Jane Austen doing just that, really. Uh, yes, novels for I will not adopt that ungenerous and impolite custom, so common within novel writers. This is the narrator of Northanger Abbey, of degrading by their contemptuous sense of the very performances to the number of which they are themselves adding, joining with their greatest enemies and bestowing the harshest epithets on such works, and scarcely ever permitting them to be read by their own heroine, uh, who if she accidentally takes up a novel, is sure to turn over its insipid pages with disgust. Alas, if the heroine of one novel uh, be not patronised by the heroine of another, from whom can she expect protection and regard? I cannot approve of it. So let us leave it to the reviewers to abuse such effusions of fancy at their leisure, and over every new novel to talk in threadbare strains of the trash with which the press now groans. Let us not desert one another. We are an injured body. So I think Austin's got this sense of women who read are this group, you know, let us support each other. Um, let us write about women reading. And, Actually, Nina does exactly that. Um, so this is Marina Carno, and she's talking about Nina's version of Northanger Abbey. And she outlines for us, this is the only thing that's been written about Nina, I think, or one of very few. Uh, but she outlines some of the similarities. So the main characters of Nina's uh, book, What Became of Mr Desmond, are David and Honoria Desmond. And these are, Carno says, uh, modern versions of uh, Henry and Catherine Tilney, characters from Northanger Abbey. As they might be imagined, years after their marriage, like Henry, who understands muslins to Mrs. Allen's heart's delight, David Desmond flatters himself that the more becoming, as well as the most lasting dresses his wife wore, were the ones of his own choosing. His interest in domestic matters extends to the pattern of the new tablecloth, the price of eggs, the decoration of their sitting room. As the narrator first observes, Mr. Desmond was a domesticated man. His wife, Catherine Morland, like savours romances, so she's reading, and consequently neglects domestic matters, a thing to which she roused herself uh, from these pleasing rounds of imagination with difficulty and reluctance, seeming to come back to it from distant spaces, a little dreamy eyed and absent. So um, Honoria is kind of like Catherine Morland, she's in, involved in these books. Um, they, the two inhabit the Domain, which is the ancestral family mansion whose old tower dates back to Norman times, a clear counterpart to Northanger Abbey. So we've got this sort of sense of a setting that's kind of similar. And we've got this sense of a gentleman who's kind of similar. And it kind of sounds like he's a good match, really. He's really good at tablecloths and curtains. Um, he's chosen the best and most lasting dresses that his wife wears. Um, and, you know, wow, what a catch. Um, but as it turns out, Nina does something really interesting with this that actually involves a really complex reading of Northanger Abbey, which is in line with where critics now are, um, not where they were when Nina was writing. So she's sort of, yeah, Desmond knows everything about the house, much better at picking his wife's dresses than she is. Um, what a gentleman. He actually disappears. He disappears uh, because his wife's failing to hang the pictures properly and he goes out to buy some different nails and he basically never comes back. Um, it takes his children, I think it's about 26 pages before they notice, which I think is interesting. Um, but, um, but yeah, you start to kind of realise when he's gone, um, <laughs> the household can actually manage without him. And in some ways, his insistence on controlling everything is just that. This wonderful gentleman kind of takes on a slightly sort of tyrannous aspect. And I think Bo's really clever how she kind of does this. Um, so yeah, he's an interesting character. One of the things that Northanger Abbey is famous for is that Catherine Morland has to kind of reassess her sense of the world. So she loves gothic novels and she kind of wants her life to be a bit more like a gothic novel. And she sort of has to kind of realise that, that it isn't going to be. Um, and it's really interesting because a similar process happens in um, What Became of Mr Desmond. But, and I'm sure you've guessed this, it actually happens to Mr Desmond. Mr Desmond and also his neighbour, um, a guy called Gervais, um, they both have to reassess um, what it is to be a gentleman. They both have to reassess their view of the world. And I think this is really interesting. Um, so yeah, if I just um, flip to this one, as you can see here, there is this, it's kind of like uh, Jane Austen, there's these comments about reading um, and in Desmond and when talking about Honoria reading all the time, 
Um, and the narrator tells us that fiction is a rearranging of the strands that go to make up ordinary life, um, which um, are basically haunting tragedy side by side with petty incident, bitter sorrow and grim comedy mixed with deadly dullness, uh, which is, I think, probably the best description of real life that you'll find, really. Um, but you can see here that she's similar to Jane Austen in a sense. She's kind of saying, look, these, these are relevant things. Um, that, yeah, there's an escapist element to them, but we need to understand that they're places where women actually can band together, where women actually might be able to um, discuss stuff that they can't discuss elsewhere. Um, and we can see this building up of Mr. Desmond's kind of tyranny. So it starts off with he doesn't like, he doesn't want gas lamps, he wants candles and how romantic and lovely. But it's so that he doesn't, he doesn't really want his sister to go into the press because she's she wants, she's interested in um, suffrage and doesn't really like that. So he kind of dissuades her from doing it. Then his wife has twins. Um, and the narrator tells us, Mr. Desmond never really rid himself of the impression that his wife had indulged in a wild and reckless enterprise. So we can see he becomes slightly kind of ridiculous um, in his kind of sense of, um, sense of the world. Um, and he, he, for him, the new woman was the last word in reproach, we're told. So we kind of get a sense of how we should view him, I think, here. But the neighbour, Gervais, he's always kind of there in the background and, and it works really nicely because you've got this happening to Mr Desmond, but you've got this happening to Gervais as well. His sister um, has had children outside of wedlock and she's ruined the family name. And this is his response. So Mr Desmond's wife having children, obviously within wedlock, but, she, you know, he sort of says, oh, she's wild and reckless. Gervais says, why did not somebody murder Teresa? How had such a woman escaped? And we get this sense the fun thing actually quite troubling about his reaction here um she's only had some children um and th th you you get the sense that there's something um actually quite nefarious underlying these two gentlemen which is kind of brilliant when you think about the journey that we go on in North Abbey, where Catherine kind of realizes that you know she sort of hopes that she's going to meet this kind of gothic you know villain and she kind of doesn't but actually Nina kind of says actually there is something quite villainous about some of these gentlemen. It just doesn't, you know, doesn't present itself with a twiddly moustache and a cape. But there, there is something about the way they think women should operate, the extent to which they feel women should, should be kind of controlled, that actually is villainous. And it's really cleverly done. Um, Gervais ends up having an affair with Mr Desmond's 15-year-old daughter. Um, and he decides that he's got to call it off. It's unseemly. And he's worried about calling it off because he thinks she's going to be distraught. Um, and um, he decides he's got to do it. So this is the exchange. Um, she says, but we're not, we're, not rel we're not relations. Why should it separate us? Uh, there's no real reason why, except that it must, he answered, forcing himself to be brutal. The only possible way. I cannot go on with it. I think it would not be um, decent. It is utterly impossible. Kaisa looked at him blankly. She was not want, wanting him pride. And as she looked, the situation seemed to change in aspect. Very well, she replied with amazing dignity and self-control. Uh, that is what is called jilting, isn't it? You are right in saying it would not be decent. It is not decent to want to marry a man who doesn't want to. And if you cannot face the first trouble that comes, you are not fit for me to want. I'm sorry I have allowed you to kiss me. She walked away from him without another word of farewell, ignoring his goodbye, darling. Um, in her breast was a raging anger, embracing Gervais, her father, all men, curs, she called them, and she said it over and over. How happy they had been without father and when Lennox was away and before Gervais came to live there. Um, she, at any rate, would never be happy again. So she's kind of unhappy, but she's not unhappy because she's lost this particular lover. She's kind of realised that there's a double standard going on, that there's, you know, she has no power. That's what she's unhappy about. And later on, um, he actually realises that she was right when she said that he was not fit for her to want. She is quite right, he thought ruefully. I am no end of a rotter. We are all rotten. What hope is there for people like us? Which is just brilliant, I think. So you've got this um, retelling, in a sense, of a story in which a girl has to kind of reassess her desire to be in a Gothic novel to, a, you know, a version um, that's much more kind of in the popular fiction vein, not particularly Gothic in the same way. 
but where actually it's the male characters that need to realize that they need to change the way they think of women um, and I just think it's just an astonishing novel that we should have heard about. They're pretty much all like that. They're pretty much all novels that I think we should have heard about. Um, but I've been going on for far too long, so I'm going to stop. Um, but yeah, do check her out. Do have a look on, you know, secondhand bookstores and see if you can find her. That was wonderful. Thank you very much, Nicola. I'm very tempted now to go and track her books down. <laughs> they sound fantastic. Thank you very much. And that covered so, so much as well. She sounds such an amazing character. Um, we've got um, a question from Josiane. Um, interesting idea of using a curfew to prevent women from engaging in prostitution and reducing the spread of venereal disease. They clearly did not think that men had a part in this. Um, similar non-serious suggestions have been put forward for a curfew recently to stop men attacking women after dark following the murder of Sarah Everard. Yeah, I think it's interesting. It's really sad, actually, how much of the, the kind of narratives that Nina Boyle is fighting against over 100 years ago now how much we're actually seeing them again, sometimes almost exactly the same language as well, the idea of protection. Um, I'm going to restrict your rights because it's the way to protect you is interesting. Yeah, yes. I think. Shocking what you said about the police vans as well. I've, I've not heard of that, putting women in with, with sex offenders. Oh, that's horrifying, isn't it? I think it's the kind of thing that, the hope is that women will be so full of shame that they won't say what's happening. And I think that was what was so brilliant about Nina is that she would always say what was happening. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and Josiane says she's very tempted as well to find, find her books. Um, and we've had a couple of thank yous as well um, from Daisy. Uh, Daisy Black, Nicola, that was just magnificent. Thank you ever so much. I knew so little about this and I'm now heading out to order as many of her books as I can find. <laughs> Such a brilliant and interesting presentation. Um, sorry, I can't stay to ask questions, but would, lo would love to talk about this more. Um, so that's really nice. And a couple of people have had to leave and, and um, just said thank you very much um, for a fascinating talk. Um, let me just see. Um, yes, and the same from Josiane. Brilliant indeed. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, I'm glad people are going to buy books, not set fire to buildings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Deb Curitan <laughs> says thank you for such a fascinating and eye-opening talk. Um, so that's brilliant as well. So lots of appreciation from people who have attended. Um, so thank you very much. I'm just keeping an eye on the Q&A and um, the chat at the moment. Um, Julia Clark um, says, thank you, Nicola. That was really interesting. Um, so thank you, Julia, for attending. Um, Lel, thank you. That was incredible. I learned so much. Um, and I think your passion really shone through as well, Nicola, which was incredible. <laughs> Thank goodness you you discovered her. <laughs> They're easy to get passionate about, I think. I yes. think it's fabulous figures. Yeah, I'm in a book group, so I think I'm going to be um, suggesting that we all track <laughs> one of her books down. What um, became of Mr Desmond is the easiest to get hold of, because it's right. on print on demand really easily I think it's probably the the one to get you know everybody will be able to get that one okay that's lovely um no more questions at the moment so I think it was such a comprehensive talk uh, oh a couple, couple of things um Claire Allen says does she write about animals at all <laughs> um she's got a thing about how you know somebody is good is that they like animals um all of her heroines have dogs and cats and they all want them to be on the sofa and on the bed and i think that's the mark of a good woman <laughs> for nina <laughs> oh that's lovely um tom says thank you for a fascinating talk this is one suffragette i've not heard about before um so i think we'll all be spreading the word now uh, about her uh, Claire Allen says great thanks very much 
So, um, yes, thank you very much, Nicola. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And we look forward to welcoming you back at some stage. Um, Julia says, um, Julia Clark, I think the point you made about bringing women together, women of different classes, is there an equivalent in our days, do you think? I don't know, actually. That's a good question, mm. isn't it? I don't know whether, um, I think it was a kind of once, more than once in a generation, actually, opportunity. I think, sadly, we often don't remember working class suffragettes, but they did exist. Mm. Um, and obviously, these women frequently were very different, you know, politically otherwise. Um, so Edith Watson is often as, uh, associated um, with a kind of centre-right politics. Her best friend was a socialist. Uh, she lived with her for many years. So there's this coming together of difference that I really like. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, um, I don't know whether we have that now. Um, it would be nice if we could get it, wouldn't it? It would, definitely. Yes, often it's a negative. It's from a negative situation, isn't it? Um, rather than um, something more positive. Uh, but thank you, Julia, for that question. Um, I think that is everything. So thank you very much to everyone for attending tonight, and thank you once again to Nicola uh, for tonight's fascinating lecture. And we've got more coming up. Um, in the next uh, few weeks. So um, on Thursday evening, we've got Dr. Elaine Arnold um, talking about what connects the Knife Angel, the Youth Justice Board and the United Nations, so a very different uh, topic. Um, so um, yes, thank you very much, Nicola, and we look forward to hearing more um, from you, hopefully, um, in the future. So and th uh, thank you from Josie Ann as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Nicola. Bye. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Bye-bye.